Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students I welcome you all to this lecture series on quantum chemistry and spectroscopy In this course we'll go through this interesting world of quantum mechanics and we would see the relevance of quantum mechanics in chemistry. But before we do that, we would in today's class discuss why was there a necessity for quantum mechanics? How the, how the field of quantum mechanics originated? What are the reasons behind it? What are the stories behind it? That will be the broad topic of today's uh, lecture. By the end of 19th century, physics had made significant progress and there was a feeling that the field was stagnating after seeing a rapid progress in many different subfields of physics. For example, by then uh, the classi me classical mechanics was well understood thanks to the seminal work of Newton, Hamilton, Lagrange. Elasticity, elasticity hydrodynamics were well understood, thermodynamics, the concept of entropy, heat engines were all uh, popular by then, electric effect, magnetic effect were all well understood. Even class statistical mechanics thanks to the works of Boltzmann were also very popular and were well understood. Uh, at the same time, uh, chemistry was also witnessing rapid uh, progress. By then, the periodic table was more or less settled. Kekule had his famous dream about the benzene structure and uh, chemical kinetics had progressed uh, quite a bit. At this juncture, there originated two subfields of physics that changed the face of science that we know now. They were one is theory of relativity, the other is quantum theory. Theory of relativity dealt with systems or the bodies that travel at very high speed to the limit of uh, speed of light. On the other hand, quantum theory deals with subatomic particles, micros microscopic world. These two theories, the theory of relativity and quantum theory together constitute what we call modern physics. These two fields introduced many new terminologies in, in, in the language of science. They brought forth many interesting ideas which were unheard of before. For example, theory of relativity talked about time dilation, space time wrap. On the other hand, quantum theory talked about uncertainty, wave particle duality and things like that. Uh, together, these two fields revolutionized uh, the fate of uh, science. Although theory of relativity has had very little influence on chemistry except for uh, the great uh, uh, relativistic effects in heavy elements. On the other hand, quantum theory had profound influence on chemistry. So much so that in today's world, quantum chemistry is an integral part of any chemistry department or any chemistry syllabus. Modern research in all fields of chemistry heavily depend on the progress of quantum chemistry. Today's organic chemistry, today's inorganic chemistry, biological chemistry, materials chemistry are strongly influenced by our knowledge of quantum chemistry. So, in this course, we will learn more about quantum chemistry, but before that, in today's class, we will discuss about the stories behind the birth of quantum mechanics. How did it uh, uh, come, into, come into play? It was not like that, that a smart person on one fine morning decided that okay, I should do something uh, interesting or revolutionarily uh, and then there was birth of quantum mechanics. No, it was not. The birth of quantum mechanics was a prolonged process. There were experiments after experiments which were pointing out the lacunae of classical mechanics or the classical physics that we had understood. The experiments were not we, we were not able to explain those experiments by our existing knowledge. And at that point of time, quantum mechanics came uh, out as, as, as a uh, savior to 
explain many interesting experimental effects. In today's class, uh, we will discuss about some of those experiments that classical mechanics could not explain. Our first example is uh, the black body radiation. We all know that when we heat a substance, it emits radiation. As we keep on heating it more, the, radi the color of the radiation keeps changing. There exists an ideal body that absorbs and emits all radiations and this ideal body is called black body and the, and the radiation that it emits are called black body radiation. When one carries out experiments on this idealized body, the black bodies, one sees the spectral density that comes out as a function of frequency has some dependence like, like this as it is shown here. As one can see, the spectral density uh, which is plotted uh, in the y axis, in the y axis uh, has strong dependence on then the frequency uh, of the emitted radiation. Uh, these spectral densities, uh, different curves represent for different temperatures. So, that means, if the black body is at different temperature T 1 or T 2, T 3 uh, up to T 6 different temperatures, then how the spectral density uh, uh, evolves or how the spectral density appears are for different frequencies. Uh, if we look at any particular uh, plot here, suppose we consider T 4, then we see that the spectral density is maximum at, at a particular frequency over here and at both lower frequency and at higher frequency, the spect spectral density decreases. The maximum of the spectral density we can see keeps increasing to uh, keeps going towards higher frequency as we increase the temperature. Now, uh, the area under this curve, the spectral density versus frequency curve represent the energy per unit volume of the black body. So, as you can see that the area under this T 6 curve is significantly higher than the area under this T 1 curve for example. This makes sense because the black body at higher temperature T 6 can emit more energy than it can do at a lower temperature T 1. The existing knowledge on, uh, on that came out from classical uh, uh, physics gave us some idea about how spectral density could be de could depend on frequency. Existing knowledge from classical uh, physics suggested that the spectral density rho would have a dependence on frequency as nu square. If I plot this rho as a function of nu square, uh, this would appear something like this. This curve this line simply goes up as a function of nu square, the fre uh, frequency square. Now, what you observe here is that at lower frequency, the agreement between the classical mechanics prediction, which is which goes by uh, the name Rayleigh Jeans law. This is the prediction by classical mechanics, uh, also known as uh, in this case Rayleigh-Jeans law, and these are the experimental curves. As you can see, at lower frequency, the agreement between the uh, predicted uh, 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 curve and the experimentally observed curves, the, the agreement is good. However, at higher frequency region, the agreement is measurable. In particular, in the ultraviolet frequency region, UV region, this agreement is extremely bad. So, this problem uh, was uh, popularly known as ultraviolet catastrophe. Uh, why was this called catastrophe? The reason is the following. As I said that the area under these curves represent the energy that the black body is emitting. So, if you try to find out the area under the curve that the Rayleigh-Jeans law provides, you would see that since this curve is unbound, it simply goes uh, up as a uh, function of frequency nu. So, therefore, the area under this curve is in principle infinite because this is not a bounded curve. Now, since the area under this curve is infinite, that means Rayleigh-Jeans law predicts 
that any black body at any temperature would emit infinite amount of energy and that is not what we are observing and that is also not, not a meaningful result to have. So, this ultraviolet catastrophe, catastrophe was bothering the science, scientist at that moment and that is when Max Planck looked at this problem. When Max Planck looked at this problem, he observed one thing that uh, at the higher frequency uh, radiations appear only at higher temperature. For example, you see this the, the spectral density of the, the frequencies in this region is present only in the T 6 curve, whereas this these frequencies are not present in T 1 or T 2 curves for example. So, one observation is that that higher frequency radiations come out only at higher temperature. By then we knew that higher temperature meant higher energy. So, at higher temperature the system or the uh, oscillators that, that uh, constitute the black body they had higher energy for example, but we did not know how energy is related to frequency at that time. So, Max Planck's first uh, observation was that, that he saw that since higher frequency arise, higher, higher frequencies are activated only at higher temperature. So, he suggested that perhaps there exists a relation between frequency and energy. The energy in this case is the energy of the oscillators that observe or emit the black body radiations. So, what Max Planck suggested is that the energy of this black body oscillators is proportional to nu the frequency and he carried out several experiments to find this proportionality constant and it turned out the proportionality constant he gave the name of H which is the famous Planck's constant. Which has a value of 6.626 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. This is his first assumption that he made. Second, he said that not only energy has a dependence of frequency, but also the oscillators of the black body, the black body oscillators can observe and emit energy in integral multiples of this h nu. So, what he suggested that the energy of these oscillators are h nu multiplied by some integers some integer n, where he suggested n is n integer 1, 2, 3 and so on so forth. Once he made these two assumptions that energy is proportional to the frequency and the black body oscillators observe and emit uh, radiation uh, as, as integral multiple of h nu and then he did uh, some uh, simple exercise which actually reproduced all the experimental curves beautifully. So, Max Planck's idea these two uh, assumption could resolve the problem that we are experiencing in black body radiation and we understood that what is what could be the physics behind it. However, at that time uh, this is these two assumptions were quite revolutionary. For example, in particular when one tells that the energy of the oscillator is not continuous that means, the oscillators energy uh, can, uh, the oscillators cannot have any energy rather they can have only some discrete values of energies like 1 h nu or 2 h nu or 3 h nu or 4 h nu. This discrete nature of energy or the quantized nature of energy was very perplexing. Because so far we always thought that we human beings we invented numbers, we invented numbers to make our life easier to count things. We thought that nature perhaps did not know about this number, but here is an example where we see that the experimental observation can only be explained when one assumes that the energy of the oscillators is not continuous rather is a discrete and quantized it can take discrete and quantized value. This is this is how Max Planck could resolve the black body radiation problem and now we will look at another example uh, how classical mechanics could not explain uh, the experimental observations. Uh, the next example is uh, the 
uh, photoelectric effect. We know we know that when we shine a uh, light on a metal surface beyond a point when when we provide enough energy to this metal, the metal will lose an electron and this electron is called photoelectron and this effect is photoelectric effect. And this electron that comes out of the metal, we can observe it by connecting it through an electric circuit and looking at the current. The photoelectric effect had a, had a simple premise, it said that the kinetic energy of the electron E k E is simply energy of the light minus phi 0 or the work function of the metal. Each metal has a given value of phi 0 or the work function which is the threshold amount of energy that you must supply before the metal can leave out its electron. So, the energy that you provide to the system must be greater than your phi 0 and the remaining part of the energy after taking care of this phi 0 or the threshold energy, the remaining part of the energy is translated to the kinetic energy of the electron. So, that means the ejected electron that comes out of the metal would travel that much faster if you provide higher and higher energy. Uh, at that time uh, classical mechanics had a wrong uh, notion, it suggested that the energy of light actually corresponds to its intensity. That means, what it wanted to uh, explain the uh, when one uh, wanted to explain the photoelectric effects through the knowledge of quantum uh, existing uh, classical mechanics, it would have meant to, uh, uh, to the following effect that if I use high intensity light that because intensity corresponds to the energy in that sense. If I use high intensity light, I would be able to do uh, observe photoelectric effect and by increasing the intensity of the light further and further, I would see that the kinetic energy of the ejected photoelectrons are increasing. However, the experiments told a different story. The experiments that, uh, that were uh, done were suggesting that if, uh, at some particular frequencies even extremely low intensity light could eject photoelectron and we could see photoelectric effects beautifully even with very low intensity light. But on the other hand some other uh, color light or color, uh, light with some other frequency even when we are using extremely high intensity they were unable to show photoelectric effect. So, what was going on there? Uh, this problem was uh, resolved by Einstein. Uh, his essential assumption was that uh, the energy of this light E is not proportional to the intensity, rather it is proportional to the frequency of the light. And the proportionality constant, he carried out several experiments and experimentally determined the proportionality constant as h, which had exactly the same value as we had uh, in the black body radiation effect 6.62 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. Now, this is a completely unrelated, unrelated experiment to that of black body radiation. However, the experimental uh, result suggested that the energy is proportional to frequency with a proportionality constant of h as, as the same value that we got in the previous. So, in this case the energy of the electromagnetic radiation or energy of light is equals h nu. Then Einstein had another assumption, assumption to make. Uh, the second assumption is that, that the energy of light uh, comes in some packets and these packets Einstein uh, suggested a name for it and it is uh, used they are called photons. The energy of this light come in certain packets and the energy of this packet is given by h nu. One packet of energy corresponds to the 
h nu energy of one packet of uh, light energy corresponds to the uh, corresponds to the value of h nu where nu is the frequency of that light when you change the electro, uh, the wavelength of the light or the frequency of the light the energy of that packet of that light of that photon uh, changes and the third assumption which is uh, kind of related to the second one is actually that the the light which we always knew as, as a wave has a particle like nature. Light has particle like nature. Now, with these three assumptions, uh, Einstein could uh, explain the photoelectric effect. We will go through the arguments uh, uh, now. For example, since we have the energy now proportional to the frequency, it could e easily explain the experimental observation that some light which have higher frequency, they could emit photoelectron even at lower intensity. Remember, when we say that intensity is proportional to energy, in that case what we mean is that we have to have high intense light to do the to, to show the photoelectric effect, but now we are telling intensity is not related to the energy of the light rather frequency is related to the energy of the light. So, therefore, if your frequency matches or frequency is beyond the threshold energy phi 0 or the work function of the metal, then the photoelectric effect should be observable. And if the frequency of the light is lower the energy corresponding to uh, the frequency of the light, if it is lower than the work function of the metal, no matter how intense light you bring, it is not going to show you photoelectron. The photoelectric effect will be absent. That is because the energy is related to the frequency and not intensity. Now, what does intensity uh, mean? Intensity in this uh, uh, in, the, in the new explanation represent that how many packets of light energy are there in this in this source radiation. For example, high intensity light would mean that you have many many photons of the same energy corresponding to the frequency. So, now the frequency meant energy and the intensity meant how many packets of energy are there in that uh, in that radiation source. So, with this ex explanation the anomalies that were apparent in in photoelectric effect experiments could be e easily re easily resolved. Uh, here one must point out that, that we discussed so far two different experiments, one the black body radiation, another the photoelectric effect. They are completely unrelated experiments. However, it turned out that both in both the experiments, we, we suggested that there is some quantization. In the photoelectric effect, the quantization was the energy of the oscillators and in the sport, I am sorry, the, in the black body effect uh, experiment, the quantization was uh, for the black body oscillators and in the photoelectric effect, the quantization is the in, in the in sense in the sense of energy of the radiation. And in both the experiments, we had this proportionality constant of a re relation between energy and frequency with a proportionality constant of h, which is the Planck's constant and both of them have the same value. So, there is something deeper and more fundamental that was not understood by then. So, it was by looking at these two completely un unrelated experiment, it was apparent. Uh, now, uh, in, in this uh, lecture, uh, we we discuss this effect, and in in next uh, lecture we would actually go through some more experiments and see uh, and see how uh, the more many more experiments could not be explained through existing knowledge in knowledge in quantum mech, uh, in classical mechanics and how new ideas uh, fundamentally different from what we knew before how new ideas were coming forward and how new ideas were needed to explain those experimental uh, results that we are seeing. Uh, this is where we would uh, conclude today and then we will continue in the next class. Thank you.